Good morning everybody, my name is Dr Nick Fair from the University of Southampton uh, and in this particular session we're going to be looking at an introduction to networked learning. Some of you may already know what networked learning is, uh, others of you this may be a new concept. So what we'll do today is we'll first of all start off by looking at what it means to learn in the digital age. In other words, what are the theories that underpin this idea of network learning? Then we'll look at what network learning actually is, and then we'll look at the role of personal learning networks within the concepts of network learning. Now the first thing to say is that network learning is not a learning theory, it is a pedagogy. In other words, it's a way that can help us to design our classes and teaching and learning activities. But, like any good pedagogy, it's always underpinned by a theory. Now, before we get into looking at learning theories, uh, I would first of all like to ask you to take a look at this picture and tell me, is there anything wrong with this picture when it comes to teaching and learning? So just take a moment to have a look at that and think about it. And when you're doing this, I'd like you to think about the questions, how active are the learners in this particular uh, picture? Also, what type of interactions are happening in this picture? Then think about what technologies are people using here? And finally, think about when else in life would you ever be in a situation like this? OK. So I'd like you to keep in mind some of those questions while we go through the rest of the session and we'll return to those at various points quite regularly uh, to see if our understanding changes at all. So first of all then, what does it mean to learn in the digital age? Now the digital age obviously really means the age that we are living in now, uh, one where we have the internet, where we have um, smart devices, particularly smartphones, uh, as our fingertips generally uh, and of course we know this is not true for all places in the world and all types of people in the world but overall um, m the majority of people do have access to some sort of digital device and to the internet and so we can generally call the whole period the digital age. Now there are three main theories that underpin this idea of network learning and we'll look at these first before moving on to uh, network learning itself. The first is social constructivism, the second is socio-technical theory, and the third is connectivism. Some of these theories you may know already, others may be new to you. Uh, so let's see what we can discover as we go through. So thinking about these pictures again, moving back to this picture, compare this one to the first picture we looked at and ask yourself those same questions. In particular here, I'd like you to think about those questions we asked ourselves the first two questions, how active are the people, in the, in the learners in particular, in this picture, and what type of interaction is happening? And compare that with the picture we saw at the start. So hopefully you have noticed that that picture represents the idea of social constructivism. You can see that the learners are active and they're learning actively with each other uh, through, and the interactions that are occurring are face-to-face -face interactions or um, technology mediated interactions but where people are uh, interacting together as equals, as peers. And formally social constructivism uh, recognises this idea by suggesting that it's through the socially accepted frameworks of language and culture that meaning can be developed and knowledge can be transmitted between particular individuals and groups of people in specific social contexts. What this really means is that by sharing a language, by sharing a culture, we can also share knowledge and develop understanding. Uh, for example, we might choose to call uh, a glass by a different word but so long as both of us understand what that word means, then we can understand a sentence such as I would like a glass of water becoming I would like a shoe of water because we've both agreed and understood from each other that shoe means that uh, the container in which you can put water and from which you can drink. So it's through these shared understandings, shared languages, shared cultures uh, that we can develop knowledge and transmit ideas 
and uh, form an understanding uh, of uh, life and the universe around us. And this best occurs through interactions with multiple other people, not on your own or not just from a single other person. So thinking back to that picture we saw at the beginning, we had a teacher, in this case a single other person, sharing their knowledge with the learners. But social constructivism suggests that learning is better when the interactions are with multiple other people. So the key takeaway here is that in theory, learning requires active interaction with others. But in practice, in other words, in the classroom, what this means is collaborative peer learning. In other words, the peers or your equals, your other classmates, the other students, working together, interacting together, sharing together in order to generate learning together. So that's the first of our theories underpinning um, network learning, this idea of interactions between people who are uh, equal with each other. Now here's a picture representing the second of our theories. This is socio-technical theory. This theory is slightly different from the other two that we're looking at because it doesn't come from the field of education. It comes from the field of science and technology studies and in particular an area called web science. Uh, it's a growing, the, uh, growing theory in terms of its popularity and understanding, but it's still something that those of you from an educational background may not have come across before. So again, looking at this particular picture, what are the differences you can see here? And I'd like you to think back to our third question around technology and what technologies are being used. So socio-technical theory uh, suggests that the technologies that are available to a society at a single point in time will influence how that society develops. For example, the invention of the wheel influenced how society developed because it allowed us to transport things more easily and more quickly from one place to another. The invention of the printing press influenced the development of society because suddenly we could have printed books uh, in, made in multiple copies and shared across many, many more people than, could before, uh, than was the case before. And of course, the internet is the most uh, recent of these uh, enormously changing technologies uh, that has significantly um, influenced the way society has developed so that we now have um, huge amounts of information and entertainment and people uh, that we can access from small devices that we can carry around in our pockets. So technologies influence the development of society, but at the same time, society develops the way technologies develop. So, for example, if we go back to the idea of the wheel, so the wheel enabled the horse and cart to come into existence, but society wanted to be able to move more goods, and they wanted to do so much more quickly, and they wanted to do so more comfortably. And along with all sorts of other inventions and many things that they tried and things that failed, but eventually the horse and cart technology led to the invention of the car. Same with phones. People wanted to communicate, a phone was a good way to do that when it was on the wall at home, but it had limitations. People didn't want to have to be in a fixed room uh, using a fixed phone to be able to be in contact with each other. So then again, after much trial and error and many failed technologies, in the end, a home phone led to a smartphone. So what this means is that while technologies help to shape and um, govern the way societies develop, Societies also shape and govern the way technologies develop in an interconnected and reciprocal way. And what this means for teaching and learning in particular, the key takeaway from this theory, is that in theory, people, societies and technologies cannot be separated. One affects the other and the other affects the one. And in practice, in the classroom, what this means is that learning cannot be separated from the technologies used for learning. So again, if we think back to that first picture with the students sitting there in the lecture theatre, just looking up at the, at the, the um, PowerPoint presentation, you can see there that there's no technology use. So can there be effective learning happening there when learning cannot be separated from technology, just as society cannot be separated from technology? So that's the second of our theories that govern uh, or underpin network learning. 
The third theory is connectivism. Again, this is represented by this picture. And again, just take a moment here to think about all three of our um, questions about how active the learners are, uh, what interactions are occurring and what technologies are being used. So connectivism is a learning theory, although there is some debate around whether it actually qualifies as a theory or not. But that's not something we're going to get into here. However, uh, connectivism stems from the uh, world of education. Uh, and is a theory uh, that um, involves uh, multiple different people and technologies and information and ideas connecting together. So the idea behind connectivism is that knowledge and skills emerge by making connections between different domains of activity, such as experience, learning and resources, as well as between individuals in a social network. What that really means is that we, we, we draw from all different parts of our lives, our experiences, our prior um, educational learning uh, and all the different resources that we can now um, access thanks to the internet and to digital technologies. And we also draw from connections we make with other people. Those can be online connections and offline connections um, and all those people that are around us that form our social network. Not necessarily a social network in the sense of Facebook, but in the sense of a network of people that we are connected to. And importantly, connectivism suggests that knowledge rests in a diversity of opinions and in the capacity to form these connections between information and opinions and people. And we can identify useful information patterns. So we, we, we make these connections and we can see patterns between different people and different information and we start to learn, ah, OK, so this is how these things connect or this is this is why people think this way or this is how uh, one piece of information can inform another piece of information. And that process of making the connections and identifying the patterns is the process of learning. So the key takeaway here is that in theory, learning is about making these connections and identifying these patterns. And that means, importantly, between distributed information and diverse people. In other words, there must be a big range of ideas and a big uh, diversity of individuals from whom you can uh, make connections and identify useful patterns. And in terms of practice in the classroom, what this means is that learning requires an active and useful network. So each learner needs to be part of a network. So what does all this mean when it comes to network learning? Again, Thinking back to our pictures, what we have here in this picture is the idea of all of those different theories joined together. So we've got peers or students linked together, connected together and interacting together. This can be when they're all together in the same classroom, but it can also be through their different technologies where they're linked up in forums and online, uh, in chat rooms, in, in uh, social media, uh, on university or uh, college um, learning management systems. Uh, but those students are also using those technologies not just to connect with each other, but to connect with all sorts of different information sources and different resources for learning. So network learning is the combination of technologies, interactions and um, making connections. So, formally, network learning can be defined as learning in which technology is used to create networks of connections between one learner and other learners, between learners, tutors and information, and between a learning community and its learning resources. And our role as educators is to help our students to create these networks of connections, to guide them in the people with whom they should connect, and the information that they should connect with and the communities and the resources that they should become part of. And this is quite a different role for a teacher in comparison with that first picture we saw of the teacher standing at the front of the room and talking at the students. So, the key concepts under in terms of from the educator's perspective uh, in network learning 
is the idea of a personal learning network. So rather than thinking of a learner as a, as a, as a body who comes into your classroom and does things, tasks or listens or writes notes or um, other type of activities, it's much more useful for an educator to think of a learner as somebody who is at the center of a personal learning network. So personal learning network is the network of connections that the individual chooses to make with different people, tech, different technological devices, a whole range of digital tools and services, and lots and lots of online and offline information resources. And they use all of these things to help them with their learning activities in all learning contexts. That can be formally when they're in the classroom or informally when they're at home working on assignments uh, or semi-formally in, in uh, say a library situation. So a student is not just a, a closed single individual body located in a physical space and time. Rather, they are the center of a network that has no boundaries or boundaries way beyond the classroom that's not, not um, located in one physical place but distributed across all these different people and networks uh, and information sources. And when we start to think of a student in this way, in other words, to think of the student as networked uh, and, as, and at the center of their own personal learning network, it starts to help us to begin to um, aid those students in the way that they learn, not by just giving them information or making them watch a PowerPoint presentation, but rather by assisting the learners to build, maintain and actively use their personal learning network. Now the key ideas here are building the network, so as educators we should help our students to, to make the connections. Then maintain the network, so again as educators we need to help the students or guide the students in how to form effective connections. It's not enough just to connect with, some, with a, a particular person online or a particular resource uh, and then have no more connections with them for years and years uh, until such time as the connection is more or less uh, forgotten or has been um, lost. So maintaining those connections, especially the ones that are useful and valuable for learning purposes, is very important. And then, of course, you have to actively use all these connections for learning purposes. Um, so, well, again, the educator role in that particular um, scenario is to guide the students in how to use those networks effectively how to identify what's a good um, person or a good information resource to connect with, how to make judgments about the information and opinions and ideas that are received, how to connect with peers and share ideas in a way that's respectful. Uh, and so, as the educator, our focus should be on delivering this network learning through uh, the use of a personal learning network. So to summarise, let's go back to this picture and on the light of what we've seen and talked about so far in this session, is there anything wrong with this picture now? Hopefully you can spot lots of things wrong with this picture. To summarise, network learning has the idea that each student comes with their own personal learning network. That network is not limited to the classroom or the physical body or the time that they are currently occupying. It's instead a, a network of diverse people, of distributed information, of technologies that are used to access and analyse and assess the information. It's a network of connections to peers, to teachers, to other experts, to information sources. And students uh, activate all of these connections and find patterns and gain information and understanding and share their learning and opinions with each other via these networks. So network learning is the process of teaching and learning in this way. Okay, so that was a quick overview of network learning. But if you're interested in finding out more about this, uh, then can I please encourage you to uh, have a go at this activity. In this activity, you'll be able to map your own personal learning network. We all have them, whether we're teachers, learners, or people who are not anything to do with education. In other words, we all have connections to people, to devices, uh, and we use them for certain purposes and reasons. So to do this activity, please follow this link 
It'll take about 10 minutes to complete the survey you'll find there. And at the end of the survey, you'll find a link uh, and a um, personal ID number uh, that will allow you to um, see your personal learning network live and online. It will look something like this uh, network map you can see on the right here. Uh, only this one is for many thousands of people. Your one will be just for you and will be much, much smaller than that. You will then be able to compare your own personal learning network with the personal learning network of all of those other people, all of those people who are like you by selecting on the right hand side, as you can see of this picture, you can select your gender, your age, your ethnicity, where you're living and many other things so that you can see the combined map for all the people who are just like you. Of course, if you want, you can always look at the map for all the people who are completely different from you and see how your map, your personal learning network map compares with someone who's very different from you. So if you're interested in, in uh, getting deeper into this subject, uh, particularly the um, idea of a personal learning network, uh, then please also feel free to um, take part in our kind of sister MOOC uh, to this particular session, which is called Learning in the Network Age, which you'll find on Future Learn. You can see the link here to that course uh, on the right hand side at the bottom of the screen. So thank you all very much for listening and paying attention. I hope some of the ideas that we've discussed here are interesting uh, and uh, are new to you uh, and have made you think about how we teach and what it means to learn in a digital age. Um, keep in mind that picture of the lecture theatre and the students all lined up because the final question we asked at the very beginning was, where else in life do you ever do that? Where else in life do you sit in rows, not talking to anybody, and staring at the front. Well, I can think of one or two, perhaps a cinema and a theatre being the obvious examples. However, that's obviously for entertainment purposes. But for all other parts of life, we don't do that, do we? So why do we do it when we're trying to teach people? And why do we think that's a good way to learn? So I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And please enjoy the rest of your uh, course with us.